So we're continuing our, our sermon series this morning. We've been talking about our mission, our vision. Today we're going to be talking about our values. And I want to begin with this question. How far would God go to save one person? How far would God go to save just one person? When we look at the scriptures over and over and over again, the answer that we get to that question is that he would go incredibly far, farther than we can possibly imagine. One of the stories that, that I've come to love that, that is an example of that comes from Mark chapter 4 and Mark chapter 5. In Mark chapter 4, Jesus has spent all day teaching the crowds. He's with his disciples, and they've been with crowds all day long. And the scripture says, when evening came, Jesus told his disciples to get in a boat to sail across the Sea of Galilee. Now, we don't know how the disciples felt about that command, but I can only imagine it was kind of like, really? Seriously? It's been a long day. Can't we just, you know, maybe take the night off and, and get some rest? But Jesus gives the command, get in the boat, go across the Sea of Galilee. So they all pile in and they start sailing. And midway across the sea, a furious windstorm breaks out. And, and it is so treacherous that it is threatening to actually sink the ship. They are going to die in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. And, and Jesus gets up and speaks a word. And he clearly has power over this storm and it is still. And so they continue their trek. They arrive to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And no sooner do they arrive than they are met by a, a man who is out of his mind. He's oppressed by evil spirits. And he comes and he begins to insult them and shout curses at them. And once again, Jesus demonstrates that he has power over this storm as well. He speaks a word and he heals this man. And the man wants to join Jesus and the disciples and get in the boat and sail back. But Jesus said, no, you need to stay here and you need to go tell others what I've done for you. So this man has met Jesus and, and 10 minutes later, he's already in, included in the mission to go. Jesus is sending him to go. And with that, Jesus and the disciples get back in the boat and sail back to where they started. So think about everything that they did. They, they've been all day with people. They're fatigued. They're tired. They get in a boat in the evening. They sail across the sea through a storm that threatens to kill them. They arrive, and they're greeted by someone who's not very happy that they're there. Heal him, get in the boat, and go all the way back. How far would God go to rescue just one person? All throughout Scripture, we see the answer to that. And of course, the, the clearest answer to that is what we see at the cross. When we take a, a good look at the cross, we see the extent of how far God is willing to go to save one person, so that one person might be healed, so that one person who's, who's miserable, who's suffering, might know peace, so that one person who's far from God might be drawn near, so that one person might be added to the team of disciples and sent out on mission. So the question that we need to be asking is not, how far will God go? He's answered that question. The question is, how far will I go? And how far will we go together as a church for one person? How willing am I and how willing are you to actually rearrange your schedule when it's not, not convenient, because it's never convenient, to reach out to someone, to befriend someone? How far are you willing to go if that someone is not in your typical circle of friends? Maybe there's something about them that's just a little bit different. How willing are you to make it a priority of your prayers that I'm going to pray for this person, that God might move in their life? And today I'm asking the question, how willing are you to identify them to write their name on a, on a card and drop that in this bowl, to say, this is the person that I believe God is calling me to, to reach out to, and I'm going to make it a matter of prayer, and I'm going to love them intentionally, and I'm going to rearrange my life. We're going to trust God. He's going to do with that whatever he wants. 
but I'm going to be faithful. How willing are you? Our mission here at Second is that one more person might come to know the saving love of Jesus. That one more person. And the only way that we are going to live into that mission is if the answer to the question is, I'm willing. If your answer is, in the spirit of Isaiah, here I am, Lord, send me. Each one of us working to reach one person so that one person might come to know the saving love of Jesus. That's our mission. That's our vision. I I think it's clear. I think it's compelling. And as we do that, as a church, we're going to be guided by a couple core values. Last week, we introduced the first two. They're vertical values. They're values that keep us anchored as a a God-centered church. Because what we read from Scripture last week is that if the tree's not healthy, the fruit's not going to be healthy. So the only way that we're going to be healthy as a church is if we attend to our relationship with God. And so our vertical values are the authority of Scripture and the priority of prayer. So God has spoken, and God speaks. And the primary way God has spoken is through his word. And so if we want to be a church that knows God, if we want to be disciples that that know God, there is no other way to arrive at that than being uh, steeped in the word of God. And then giving that word the authority that it is due, God has spoken, and his word is is sovereign. He is the Lord, and so we have to, to bow before his word. So we value the authority of scripture, and we also value the priority of prayer. And I mean that in two ways. One, prayer is the, the means that God has given us to be in relationship with him. So he's reconciled us to himself. He's done that through the cross. And what he's done is he's opened the the doors to the throne room and invited us in, commanded us to come in. And the way we enter into the throne room is through a spirit of prayer. And so we want to put the emphasis on the priority of prayer. But the second thing we mean by that is that that things are only going to happen if God is at work. I think of Psalm 127, verse 1. It says, Unless the Lord builds the city, the builders are laboring in vain. They're wasting their time. And unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen, they stand guard in vain. And so this this vision and this mission, it has to be driven through prayer. And if God's not in it, if God's not working, then, then, you know, we're wasting our time. So these are the vertical values that anchor us as a God-centered church. Today, we want to move forward and talk about the horizontal values. These are the values that speak about how we relate to one another, how we relate to our community, how we structure ourselves as a church. The first I want to talk about is hospitality. So we're not going to be able to spend a lot of time on each of these, but I'm probably going to spend more time on this one than the rest. Hospitality. Listen to this bombshell of a verse. Romans 5.8, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, while we were enemies of God, that's when God sent his son to die for us. Sometimes we sing the word, uh, I stand amazed in the presence. How marvelous we sing. How wonderful. Well, what's marvelous? What's mar- wonderful? What are we singing about? We're singing about the fact that God loved us while we were yet sinners. Now, the word hospitality never shows up in that verse. But I would contend that this verse is actually all about hospitality and that hospitality is an incredibly radical, countercultural idea. So let's think about Jesus, and let's replay some of the scenes where we see Jesus interacting with people. People that in that culture were looked down upon. People that were, were different. People whose lives sometimes were a mess. And when we ask the question, how did Jesus interact with them? Well, we all answer kind of reflexively, well, he loved them. And we, for, we forget how incredible that love truly is. So let's, let's just play through a few of those scenes. How about Zacchaeus? Remember Zacchaeus? 
He was a swindler. And Jesus loved him and befriended him so much that he went to his house and had a meal not only with Zacchaeus, but also with Zacchaeus' friends, fellow swindlers. And you know what happened at that meal? Laughter and joy. And guess what else? Repentance. It was in the context of Jesus' friendship and love and kindness that Zacchaeus repented. See, there's this verse that says it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. It's the kindness, it's the love, it's the grace of God that leads us to repentance. How about Levi? Levi is sitting behind his tax collector booth, and to the dismay of some of the other disciples who had just joined the team, Jesus stops at that booth and turns to Levi and says, follow me. And again, I'm I'm, I'm reading into the text. I don't know that this is true, but I imagine that the disciples are thinking, him? I mean, we're, we're shocked enough that you chose us, but Levi, the tax collector, you want him to be part of the team? Levi stands up, leaves his tax collector booth, turns disciple of Jesus, later writes the very first gospel in the New Testament, the gospel according to St. Matthew, a.k.a. Levi. How about Bartimaeus? Screaming from the the side of the road, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the disciples are frankly annoyed by Bartimaeus. Just, would you be quiet? Let the master go on his business. But Jesus doesn't see Bartimaeus as an interruption. Instead, he sees him as a man, one man, worthy of his time. And so he stops gives him attention, has compassion, heals him. We've got to talk about the story of the Samaritan woman. The Samaritan woman who could not believe what was happening one day when she went to a well to draw water. That Jesus, this Jewish rabbi, happened to be there and he actually engaged her in conversation. You see, this Samaritan woman knew that from the typical Jewish perspective, she was a woman with three strikes against her. She was a Samaritan. The Jews despised Samaritans. She was a woman looked down upon in that culture, second class. And she had kind of made a mess of some part of her life. She had five husbands. The man she was currently living with was six. And so she had this shame that she carried with her. And instead of treating her like a three strike out, Jesus stops treats her with dignity and respect and engages her in conversation. And guess what happens? Repentance. She goes back and tells everybody in her community about Jesus. She's not been with him more than 20 minutes and she's on fire. She's a witness for Jesus Christ. I love the story of the children. The children who just wanna be with Jesus And again, the disciples are rebuking them, telling them that the master doesn't have time. And Jesus turns, and instead of rebuking the children, he rebukes his disciples. Over and over again, when we look at the life of Jesus, what we see is a posture towards people. And that posture is not, I'm too important for them. I'm too holy for them. I'm too busy for them. His posture is repeatedly that these are the people for whom I've come, and I would do it for just one of them. What we see in the New Testament over and over again is the same as what we're currently seeing in our own cultural context, and that is that the most successful form of evangelism is actually hospitality. It's kindness, intentional kindness. People were drawn to Jesus primarily because of the way he treated them. His words mattered, his teaching mattered, but the first thing that drew him in was was how he showed up and how he engaged them. Jesus was good news incarnate in the flesh. Everywhere he went, good news. So if we are a Christ follower, what that means is that we are called to be good news every day where we go. 
evangelism in today's climate where people are suspicious of the church, maybe even hostile towards the church, evangelism, reaching people with the good news of Jesus Christ, is going to increasingly look like hospitality. That is the the door that, that provides the entryway into a relationship. So on one hand, hospitality is really not not uh, so difficult. With just a little bit of intentionality, a little bit of purpose, hospitality can be incredibly powerful. But on the other hand, hospitality does not come naturally. What comes naturally is exclusion. We don't have to work to do that. That kind of comes naturally. Judgment, suspicion, even condemnation. What I've observed as I've interacted with other churches is every single church that I've ever interacted with self-identifies itself as a friendly church. I have never met a church that doesn't say, we're a friendly church. But when you look a little bit closer, what that often means is we're friendly to one another and, and maybe the one another's that we know really well, but maybe not so friendly to those who don't fit into our circle that we're asking them to assimilate to us. Christ calls us to something higher than that, something greater. He loves sinners. He loves even enemies. He loves outsiders. He loves the stranger. He loves the foreigner. If we are going to be a Christian community, then we've got to do the same. So that's hospitality. Let's move on to connection. I've already introduced that in the the children's sermon. Connection, uh, like kernels of popcorn in a microwave, there are a, a couple words that pop up in Scripture over and over again, and they're the words, one another. The most frequent of those are love one another. So what's true is that God designed us for a relationship with him, but what's also true is that God designed us for a relationship with one another. This uh, jumped out at me a couple years ago. If you've ever been to a a wedding that I've done, there's a good chance you've heard me tell the story about Adam and Eve. I think I I tell the story at every single wedding. And I've done that for a number of years, and a couple years ago, something jumped out at me that I never noticed. So you know the story. God creates Adam, puts him in a garden, gives him the job of naming all the animals. Adam's doing that, and he notices there's no animal quite like himself. And God says, and it's startling because what we've heard in Genesis 1 is, it is good, it is good, it is good, over and over again. And God says in Genesis 2, it is not good for a man to be alone. Now, what jumped out at me a couple years ago was the thought that Adam wasn't alone. He was in the garden with God. And God still said it's not good for him to be alone. In other words, yes, Adam needs me, but he needs more than just me. That that I created Adam for a relationship. He needs another human being. And and yes, in in that context, we're talking about marriage, but I think the truth extends to just relationships in general. We need one another. And that's why these words, one another, they pop up all over Scripture. Here's just a sampling. Be at peace with one another. Love one another. Be devoted to one another. Honor one another. Stop passing judgment on one another. Accept one another. Instruct one another. Serve one another. Carry one another's burdens. Be patient with one another. Encourage one another. Forgive one another. Pray for one another. Confess your sins to one another. And how about this one? Offer hospitality to one another. Clearly, God has designed us as a a church and as a people to need one another. Now, I think culturally speaking, we are swimming upstream as we try to live into that command because we are not accustomed to this degree of relationship. The way our culture work is, works is that we do relationships until they no longer serve our purposes. If you hurt me, if you do something that upsets me, I just cut off. 
There's plenty of other people that I can relate to. And again, Christ calls us to something much higher than that. We're not at liberty to just cut off from one another. We've got to work through our relationships and not settle for safe and superficial. And it's just not easy. I mean, we like to talk about iron sharpens iron, but when you actually think about how iron sharpens iron, it's through friction. There's contact. I think that pencil, inside that pencil sharpener, might be saying, ouch. There's got to be contact, and that, there's got to be some, some heat, and sometimes relationships are, are messy, but we stay connected. So this is a value that we're going to pursue as a church. The third value is community involvement. Community involvement. In the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah writes uh, a, a letter to the church that has been carried into exile. They're now in this godless pagan city of Babylon. And Jeremiah writes to them some instructions. And what I would expect him to write is not what he writes. I might expect him to say, hunker down, you know, stay true to the gospel, cling to the fellowship, cling to your brothers and sisters there, and, and wait, trust God, he's going to bring you back to Jerusalem. But this is actually what he says. Seek the peace and the prosperity of the city to which I've carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it. Pray for Babylon. Because if it prospers, you too will prosper. So rather than calling his people to isolate from the community, God calls his people to engage the community, to work for the good of the community, to seek the peace and the prosperity of the community, to pray for the community. This outward orientation is not just a New Testament concept. We see it all throughout the scripture. So here is a, an interesting thought. The community does not exist to prop up the church. We live in an increasingly post-Christian context, and so we're seeing this. At one time, the community did prop up the church because we were a fairly Christian culture, but that's less and less the case. The community does not exist to help the church flourish. The church exists to help the community flourish. God has planted us in a community, and, and because we are here, we should be a blessing to our community. We're called to participate. We're called to engage. We're called to serve. We're called to work together with other churches, we're also called to work together with other local agencies for the flourishing of our communities. I've always thought this is a, a good question. If the church disappeared, would the community notice? If the church were just zapped and disappeared today, would the community notice? If the answer is not yes, then something is wrong. Next horizontal value, next generation focus. We want to have a, a next generation focus. This verse was the uh, foundation of our next campaign that we recently did from Psalm. One generation will tell of your works to another generation. They'll tell of your mighty acts. Every generation, we have multiple generations here, every generation is unique. Different from the generation that came before it and different than the generation that is following it. And that is a beautiful thing. I think it's the way the church should look. And it also creates some tensions. Second Reformed Church exists today because 106 years ago, in 1914, there were some families from First Reformed Church who were thinking about the generation coming up after them. Thinking about their children, friends of their children, thinking about their grandchildren, this next generation was no longer fluent in Dutch. They only spoke English, and yet the church was designed for the older Dutch-speaking generation. And so for two years, these families came to the consistory at First Reformed Church from 1914 to 1916, petitioning the consistory to add an English-speaking worship service but that wasn't something at the time that the church was willing to do. Change has never been easy, and it wasn't easy for them there. But what First Reform did do was they gave these families a blessing to plant a new church. 
And so these families decided it was better to navigate the turbulent waters of change than it was to choose the, the comfort and the familiarity of what they already were doing at the expense of reaching the next generation. That sacrifice was real. Presumably, they left a church that they loved, and they invested themselves time and energy and, and money. They built this church in record time. They paid it off in record time. And today now, many generations removed from that, we are recipients of their courage and their sacrifice and their faith. This church was born out of a focus on the next generation, and that's a value that we wish to continue. But it comes at a price. And the price is change. That's always been the price. One generation continuing to change, continuing to adapt so that we can continue to reach the next generation. And the minute we decide no longer to do that, we're no longer living into who we were when we were planted. So next Sunday, we are making a big change, as you know. We're changing the name of our church. And what I want to communicate today about that is that what's driving that change really is the heritage of who we are and who we have always been. If our current name is hindering the mission more than it's helping, and there have been multiple consistories over the last five, six years that have come to that conclusion, if our current name is hindering us in any way to reach just one more person, this is a change that we've got to be willing to make. And, and I may be wrong about this, but I wonder if the, the people who would be asking for this change are the, the charter members who made such a huge sacrifice, such a huge change to reach the next generation. Well, I know it's not a small thing that we're doing, and I also know that it's difficult for, for many people who have such cherished memories of this church and attach that to the name of the church. I know there's grief and I know there's loss. I'm reminded of when we removed our organ and on that last Sunday, uh, as Nathan Ankrum was up here playing it, we had people up on the platform taking pictures, people in tears because it was so dear to them. And so change always is accompanied with grief and loss. And we want to grieve what we're losing. But I am asking and I am hoping for your support that you will see the spirit in why we are doing this. If changing the name of the church might help accomplish reaching one more person for Jesus Christ. It's a decision we've got to be willing to take. The last horizontal value that uh, we're going to hold to is uh, this value of leadership, empowered leadership. The scripture says over and over again that God has gifted uh, his church. He's given every single one of us gifts. So you have a unique set of gifts and abilities and uh, perspective and circles of influence that nobody else has. A and you are part of this church. You're part of the body of Christ here at this church. And so what we need from you is to be all that you are, all that God created you to be, to be at work for the common good. The church needs you. And if you take a posture of sitting back and not using the gifts that God's given you, the church suffers. Together we are the church. You are the church. And you're needed. And so we want to put people in a position to use the gifts that God has given them to lead. We've got a clear mission. Our vision is, is compelling. And now what we need is you.